And now, right from the very beginning, the survivor guilt mechanism begins to come into play. Because nobody warned you that that's how most people were going to act. And you're sitting there saying now in response to that, I wish it was me. I want it to be me. I would have happily died for that person. You're all ate up with that. And now you come home and your spouse and your kids, they give you a big hug. And what's the thing coming out of their mouth? Thank God it wasn't you. That's a normal reaction. They may not say it, but they're feeling it with all their heart and soul because they cherish you more than any other single human being on the face of this earth. And what's your reaction to that? I wish it was me. I want it to be me. You don't understand. That moment of truth, when you need them the most, you separate yourself from them. You isolate yourself from them because you hadn't thought through the fact that that's going to be their normal reaction. And when they react that way in the absence of preparation, you're confused, you're angry, you're frustrated. There's one other thing that's working against you right now. The midbrain, my friends, the midbrain is not into denial. The midbrain's not into transference. It's not into mental gymnastics. Those aren't survival mechanisms. The midbrain simply accepts responsibility for what happened. And the message that comes shooting up from the midbrain is, this is all my fault. And what you have is the officer sitting on the curb with his head in his hands saying, it's all my fault, it's all my fault. And let me tell you a little bit about yourself as a police officer. Statistically speaking, most of you are the oldest male or female in your family. You're the individuals who throughout your life have accepted responsibility for other people's lives. You're the individual who by your very nature and by your training will stand up and accept responsibility. So your gut reaction is to say, it's my fault, it's my responsibility. I was in charge. Now, when the midbrain and the forebrain are both in alignment and both saying the same thing, you've got something really powerful going on. The best person to give you forgiveness and understanding and acceptance of what happened in that environment is the people you share the situation with. It is vital that you do that together and you share those events, the critical incident debriefings. It gives you a chance to lay those things on the table. And that becomes the goal. When you hold these things up inside of you, they eat you alive. You're only as sick as your secrets. That's half the equation. The other half is this. Pain shared is pain divided. We know how to deal with the sucking chest wound, and we know how to deal with the sucking psychic wound. And we do it by providing that social support network that works through these traumatic, horrendous events and makes it possible for us to sustain ourselves over the long haul. Men and women who put their life on the line day after day, year after year, are bonded. And by very virtue of the fact that you are at risk, you are at bonded, and by virtue of the fact that you are at risk, you will lose people. It's inevitable. When you lose people, it's like losing a family member. There are two tools that I give you to help you prepare yourself ahead of time. The first tool is justice, not vengeance. Understand this, you are sworn to justice. Vengeance, illegal acts, criminal acts, these are the things that will set the foundation for post-traumatic stress disorder and sacrifice not just yourself, but your wife and your children. Whoever it is that you're avenging did not want you to pay that price. The second factor that I want to address is life, not death. If somebody buys your life at the cost of their life, then you have no right to waste it. If you were the one to die and your partner kept going, what would you wish for your partner? You would wish for them to have the fullest, richest, cleanest, purest life they could have. Now, if your partner's the one to die, what's your job? To live a rich, full, clean, pure life. Right now, ahead of time, set aside all self-destructive thoughts and dedicate yourself to that. As time passes, troubling memories of your critical incident may revisit your mind in unexpected ways. Again, anticipating and understanding what's happening in these moments can help you minimize the dark side of your confrontation. What happens to you in a combat survival situation? The midbrain reaches up and hijacks the forebrain. When that happens, there are a set of hardwired associations that will stick with you for a long, long time. Our ancestors are trotting through the forest and they heard a lion roar. And the first time they heard a lion roar, they had to stop and say, whoa, that's a lion. I better run. The next time they heard that lion roar, it went straight from their ears to their feet and they were out of there saving seconds and it was a survival mechanism. Hardwired reflexes can be built in in just one incident. Well, when our ancestors had that lion roar that first time and they reacted to that, 
It wasn't just the roar of the lion. It was the smell of the lion. It was that part of the jungle. It was that time of day. Just thinking about the lion would make their heartbeat start racing and make them get ready for that fight or flight survival mechanism. You're in combat and you associate the smell of the gunpowder, the feel of the gun, the look of the situation, that time of day, that part of the city, the people that were with you. You associate all of that with the trauma. If you run into those kind of cues again, what will happen to you? Your heartbeat will start racing. Your respiration will start going up. Sometimes you just think about the incident. And all of a sudden, these hardwired bypasses that the midbrain has in place will kick into gear. Boom, your heartbeat is racing and your respiration is going for no good reason. One Arkansas State Trooper, he had had a shootout on a Friday. He and his partner had, had killed the bad guy. It was a righteous shoot. All was well. That Sunday, watching a swimming match on TV with his daughter, he says, my mind must have just wandered, and all of a sudden, boom. My heart was pounding. I was sweating all over my body. My face had turned red. I was hyperventilating. I was balled up into a little ball. We thought I was having a heart attack. It was an anxiety attack. That midbrain linkage had just suddenly popped into place, and all of a sudden, he was ready to deal with that event again. If your goal is to survive in combat, it's a survival mechanism. But if your goal is to live to a ripe old age, to draw your retirement and bounce not just your grandbabies, but your great-grandbabies on your knee, then it's not a survival mechanism. Then it's counterproductive. Because what happens to you is this. The first time your heart is in your throat and these things are happening and you think you're losing control of your mind and nothing frightens a human being more than thinking you've lost control of your mind. You haven't lost control of your mind, you've lost control of your body. Physiological responses are happening, and the way to stop it is with autogenic breathing, or that combat breathing. You use the breathing exercises, you reach DAC, you get control of your body, and you go ahead and drive on. Under the best of circumstances, it will take up to a full year to work your way through delinking those associations. If you don't delink that association, between the memory and the mental cues and the visual cues of the event from the physiological response, the next time it happens, it's going to be even worse. If you start hyperventilating and your heart starts pounding as you remember the event, then all you're doing is re-traumatizing yourself. And the next time it gets worse and worse and worse because you know it's going to happen and you don't know how to stop it. And you get that powerful association linked up in your mind. And the way you break that is this. You don't let that physiological arousal happen in combat if you can. After combat, you start doing the breathing exercise. Delink the memory from the physiological response. I control my body. My body does not control me. Six months later, you're in court. Now, the defense attorney has a goal. His goal is to put you back in that situation and to stress you out so bad that you're going to start having a stress response. He wants you to start hyperventilating. He wants you to perspire. He wants you to lose physical control. Because when you do, what will the jury think? They'll think you're lying. They won't trust you. They won't believe you. That's what he wants. What do you do? In through the nose, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Out through the lips, two, three, four. Answer the question. Remain calm and maintain control of your body and you'll be able to perform your mission from beginning to end. Throughout this program, Dave Grossman has talked of information and realistic practice being the tools for armoring yourself against extreme adversity. Dave shares a simple laboratory experiment to reinforce the importance of preparation in dealing with high-intensity events. If I take a bunch of rats and I divide them into three groups, now, one group of rats, I'm going to drop in a bucket of water and see how long it takes him to drown. You take this rat, rat drop him in the bucket of water, and around and around and around he goes. You know how long it takes? About 60 hours. After about 60 hours, blub, 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 there goes Mr. Whiskers in a little trail of, uh, of bubbles. I'm going to take a second group of rats. I'm going to grab this rat. I'm going to hold him upside down until he quits kicking. Now, I've stressed this rat out. This rat has never been held upside down in his life, and if I wait until he quits kicking, that means that I've got him to the point where he has given up. He's been overwhelmed by a stressor. Now, I take that rat and drop him in the water. How long is he good for? 20 minutes. That's all he's good for. Why? That combination of stressors was too great for him. He could not handle it. The, he could handle the water. He could handle being turned upside down. But the combination of the two were too great, and he dies.